All right, we want to thank you guys for being here today. Um, we are doing our weekly service dog chat, but today we have a special guest joining us. So just really quickly, let's go over the ground rules for our typical chat. We ask everybody to mute when they're not talking because that just helps flashing on the screen. We do have some people that watch the video that have seizures. And if you're not muted, background noise can make it flash as it changes between person. So anytime you're not talking, mute. If you do have something that you wanna say about what we're currently talking about, raise your hand icon if you know your reactions and can do it through there. If you're kind of tech challenged and you wanna just put your hand up in front of your face kind of thing, that's okay too. <laughs> but if you can use the reactions that helps bumps you up to the top of the screen so that we can see that you have something to add. And if you have a question that's not necessarily what we're talking about right now, go ahead and type it in the chat box and we will monitor those as they come in and get to them when we have a chance. It might take a little while, but we'll get to them. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest, Sue Williamson, author of Taking the Gur Out of Grooming and a few books that go along with that. So welcome, Sue. Thank you for inviting me along. It's really nice to be here. We're just glad you came. Thank you. Um, I just hope that everybody gets something from this evening, even if it's just, you know, brush it up regularly. <laughs> well, and that's just it. Typically, somebody may not get, you know, need the whole type of the chat, but everybody always usually needs at least one part or something. So <laughs> it should be good. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yes. So you want to tell us a little bit about who you are first and then kind of tell us about what you're doing in your grooming business? Okay, so as Penny says, I'm Sue Williamson. I'm based in the United Kingdom in the village called Leicestershire. Uh, I've been grooming for about seven years now. Before that, I worked to university for about 24 years and then I was at home with my children for a few years. So I'm a little bit a little bit older than probably most of you, uh, but I about six or seven years ago, I decided I wanted to work for myself and I'd always wanted to work with dogs. So um, grooming seemed the, the natural progression to make. Um, I, live, I live at home in Leicestershire with my husband and I've got three dogs of my own. I've got two miniature poodles and I've got a working cocker spaniel. Um, they have their own issues with grooming. My, one of my poodles is the dream to groom the, the other mini poodle and my working cocker. They're always going to be a work in progress. Um, so that gives me plenty of experience with those. And I've got a cat as well. She may make an appearance in the window later on. Uh, she doesn't need much grooming. But as well as being a dog groomer, I've also got a background in uh, Tellington Tea Touch. I'm a Tellington Tea Touch. Uh, level two practitioner uh, and if you don't know about Tellington Tea Touch it's a um, it's a method for dog well it can be used on any animals anything with a nervous system uh, Tellington Tea Touch can be used and it's based on non-habitual movements so instead of stroking a dog um, for example most people stroke dogs like that I stroke in circles because that's the Tea Touch way there are some sliding touches and some lifts as well, uh, but Tellington Tea Touch really helps dogs to relax, uh, to um, improve their proprioception, to build confidence. So it's an ideal uh, bonus for the grooming salon, really, because it means I can help the dogs calm down a lot quicker. I'm also, uh, I've got a diploma in dog behaviour from the ISCP. I've got uh, a certificate, silver certificate in low stress handling from Cattle Dog University from Dr. Sophia Yin. And I'm also an animal centered education advanced tutor. So if you've not heard of uh, ACE, animal centered education, that's the creation of Sarah Fisher, who is a big um, animal educator, behaviourist, you name it, she does it in the United Kingdom 
and ACE is all about giving dogs choice, learning about the dog so that we can help them with the struggles that they have, um, watching their observations. So it's really learning about the individual dog. We actually have place. we actually have an ACE talk that we did a couple of weeks ago, all it's about um, we kind of promoted the ACE in August group. Yes, that I know you're a part of. <laughs> And yes, um, I've been one of the organizers. kind of our discussion of how that really affected service dogs. So some of us have a little bit of it. Several of us are actually in that group. Excellent. And so I can also send you a link to that chat if you'd like to listen to it. <laughs> yes, that would be really good. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've got a really good, solid background in various aspects of dog behavior, how to keep them nice and calm. Um techniques to calm them such as the tea touch I've also got Reiki level two as well so that's another option I've got to use so really having all those skills blended together uh, means I'm really able to work with more difficult dogs so my uh, business really is predominantly I'm a dog groomer um, I don't do much behavior work anymore because we've got I've got quite a few really good behaviorists around me but I've only there's only one me around where I live so I wanted to free up my time to work with the dogs that are sensitive about grooming because there's not many options locally for other groomers to, to take on these dogs and some of them really need a, a specialist groomer to just get them through the groom let alone we don't worry about styling we just get them through a groom um, that's best suited to them so for example if a if I have a cockapoo come in that doesn't like to be brushed then the dog goes short every time um, uh, for example a poodle that doesn't like its nose shaved I don't shave the nose I scissor it instead it's just about finding what the dog finds aversive and to work around that so I can make make the grooming more pleasant. I've realized it's never gonna be, um, for some of these dogs, they're never gonna enjoy grooming. The best I can get is probably for them to tolerate it without being too aversive. Um, and to be quite honest, most of them now come running into my salon. Uh, they're really, um, really happy to see me. And we get through the groom. Most of it is done consent-based, uh, I would say, most of the dogs, 95% is consent. Uh, the other 5% will be things like I have to lift them into the bath because they can't, can't get in. Some of them I've taught um, to give me even consent to get into the bath. So uh, I've taught them to put the paws on the bath or the paws on the table as consent to be able to pick them up. So I've, hopefully I've found a way to groom most of the dogs that can't be groomed anywhere else because they get uh, aggressive. I don't like that term aggressive because it, it also implies that the dog's got some control over their behaviour and as we know they haven't so um, it's you know I, it's just a word I don't like it's like reactive I don't like that word either but it's it's a term that most people understand. So that's how I came to um, take on the, the more challenging dogs although I don't look at them as challenging because, because I, I've got the ACE experience behind me, the tea touch. I work with the dog instead of working on the dog. So the dog can, becomes to trust me first. I, I observe what they do and don't like, and I can usually find a way around their grooming issues so that we can make that a lot easier for them. So as you, you mentioned earlier as well, I've written three, I've actually got three books. Uh, they're all in the Taking the Gur series. So the first one I wrote was Taking the Gur Out of Grooming Your Dog. So this is for dog guardians who've got dogs that don't like to be brushed or don't like having the nails done. And um, that's got things in it. Um, it's got the consent methods in it that I use. It's got uh, a bit of dog behaviour to put the context there. So we're talking about calming signals, body language, trigger stacking, the autonomic nervous system. 
there's a bit of free work in there from the animal centered education and there's a bit of television research in there as well so I've taken bits of how I groom and put that in the book so that I can help guardians as well and then I've got the grooming version which is taking the girl out of the grooming salon uh, this is professional dog groomers that own salons and use a lot of equipment you know the the safety aids and high tables and it's it's just to give them a more of an understanding how the dogs might be feeling during the groom and what they can do to make the dogs feel a little bit better. And then this is my latest one, introducing your puppy to girls grooming. So this is the book. If you've got a brand new puppy, this is the book you need because this tells you how to introduce all the different um, grooming elements. So it's more manageable for the puppy so that hopefully when they have to go to the professional groomers, they're not terrified of the clippers, they, they can be brushed easily, they don't mind having the nails done, um, they don't mind having the feet touched or the faces touched and scissored. So hopefully that book will get more dogs uh, confident around grooming before they have to go to the grooming salon. Uh, so that's a bit about me and how I've got to where I am today. <laughs> it's been a bit of a whirlwind. Not, none of, Although I, I plan to become a dog groomer, none of the rest was planned. It, it just sort of happened. Uh, and I've gone with it, to be quite honest. So uh, and it's just led to lots of, um, lots of positive experiences. I've got a Facebook group called Taking the Girl Out of Grooming Dogs. And I've got 15,000 members in that group now in about two and a half years. And it's really... Um, a really helpful group so if you're having issues with your dog on any aspect of grooming just pop a question in there and there's always somebody to give you good advice on how you can help your dog in a positive way so we don't talk about things like muzzles uh, any sort of restraints um, things like the calming cradles where they're hanging on a in a cradle on the, the ph bar so it's all about positive methods to desensitize to counter condition um, to use consent based techniques so when i talk about consent based techniques that's all about um, giving the dog the option to opt out at any point so for many of the dogs i groom i groom on a low table and i sit on a little stool and I've got a little set of steps that go from the floor to the table so the dogs can get on and off the table anytime they choose. They've got no restraints on them. They've got complete freedom. So when they come on the table, they know that they're going to get groomed. When they get off the table, they know that grooming is going to stop. And it's a really clear indicator to me as well that, yes, I can groom them. No, they need a little bit of a break. And... I've been using that, that uh, consent-based grooming for about four or five years now, and it's completely changed the way I groom. I don't need to, um, I don't battle with dogs. So a lot of groomers complain that they, uh, they get tired, physically tired because the dogs are difficult on the table. I don't get that because if the dog gets, a little bit agitated if it's feeling a bit anxious it just gets off the table and when I first started using this technique I thought the dog would get off the table and that'd be a groom over they wouldn't come back unless I physically put them back on but they don't they they come onto the table and do a bit of grooming they'll get off the table go and have a quick walk around and then back onto the table ready for me to start grooming again and it's it also it still amazes me you know or four or five years on that they get choose to get back on the table when they know they're going to get groomed again but I think that sort of indicates to me that I've got a high level of trust with most of the dogs I groom they know that, that I'll be listening to them they know that they can trust me that I won't push them too far so if I can do 95 percent of the groom using consent based methods if I do have to use a little bit more force than I like using, for example, I had a dog yesterday that had got um, a claw was growing into a pad, um, a dew claw was growing into a, a stopper pad and she doesn't like having her claws done, but that was a welfare issue. So I was able to do that 
and not really upset her anymore because I've kept her nice and calm for the majority of the groom. So just pushing her a little bit more than I usually would like to because of a welfare issue. It meant that she was able to calm down really quickly again. And it wasn't, it really wasn't a battle. It was, I don't, when I uh, do dogs' feet, when I do their paws, I don't hold on to them. I just put them in my hand. And it was just a case yesterday, I did have to put my thumb on to hold the paw still while I managed to do this, uh, this claw that was growing into a pad. So it's all about building that trust as well as using a uh, table protocol. Another one I really like is uh, map protocol. So for some dogs um, that have had bad experience in grooming salons before, the table is a massive problem because that's where all their perceived bad stuff happened. And when I say I had a bad experience at the groomers before, it doesn't mean I'm saying that the groomers are bad or done nasty things to them, but the perception of that dog is that grooming experience was negative. And it may have been something purely as simple as they had to have the safety aids put on um, so they couldn't move about. So that might have been a negative experience for that dog. So by taking away those, um, those triggers that have made grooming more difficult for those dogs in the salon by not grooming them on the table, but grooming them on the floor, it just means there's less, less buildup of arousal before I start the groom. So the MAP protocol is something you can use at home really simply. So you start with a, it doesn't have to be a mat, you can use a towel, you can use a, a sheet, you can use a dog bed, but not the dog, not the bed the dog sleeps on. So basically it's just a piece of some sort of fabric. Ideally you'd want it so you can sit on it as well, you want it big enough so you can sit on it as well and it doesn't have to be on the floor, it can be on the sofa or at a, at a height where you can access the dog. So for example if you're in a wheelchair you could put the mat on the sofa so that you're at the similar height. Um, and the first thing you do is just teach the dog that on the mat things happen, off the mat things stop. So for example, um, if we're going to use the sofa, have the mat on the sofa, what I would do is put lots of treats on the sofa and every time they put a foot on that mat, I would reward that with yet another treat. So I'm not necessarily luring them onto that mat, but I just want them to choose to go on the mat. So if we keep rewarding them when they put the foot on the mat, eventually we'll shape them into getting the roll body onto the mat. So when they're happily on the mat, we can extend the duration by extending the time between treats so that they stay on that mat a bit longer. The next step to that is to just touch them and stroke them whilst they're on the mat. If they choose to get off the mat, that's when you stop the, the stroking perhaps call them back onto the mat and start again. And when they've sort of learned that uh, on the mat means things happen, off the mat, it means it stops. Then you can start introducing uh, things like um, a lightweight brush or a soft comb, just so you're building it, building up from that, just co you know, contact with your hand to, to grooming equipment. And you can use map protocol as well for things like giving eardrops or eye drops, um, any husbandry care. Um, but I really like the map protocol, like the table protocol, it's really clear. On the table or on the mat, grooming happens. Off the mat, off the table, grooming starts. And it might be that they'll just need a couple of minutes break to reset, or it might be, no, I've had enough for tonight, I can't cope with any more. In which case, you just put the mat away and get it back out again the next night or the next morning. Or you probably try it two or three times during the day and find uh, the best time for your dog. Because some dogs are better in the morning, some dogs are more cooperative in the afternoon, some are more cooperative in the evening. So we just have to work out what what type of dog we've got, have we got an early bird, have we got a night owl? Because if, if they struggle with physical contact in the morning and we're doing all this work in the morning, we're sort of not working with them as 
efficiently as we would if we find a nice time when they're quite calm, uh, where they're more likely to be relaxed. And then doing this work will be much easier for them and it's been much easier for you. Um, so as, as well as those two, I've got another couple of protocols I use uh, is a chin rest. So I teach the dog to put the chin in my hand. So it looks like that. And then that means I can work around the face. Uh, but you can also use a chin rest to brush the rest of the body as well. Um, and the, there are videos on YouTube how to train the chin rest or this. Um, it's in all my books as well. So I find that's a really useful one to use for the face. Um, and again, face in hand, grooming happens, face off, grooming stops. And uh, another nice one I like is a pause on. So I've got a little poodle that I groom and we've taught, she loves putting a, a pause on people. So we've taught her that while she's got pause on me, I'm going to groom her when she takes the pause off, the grooming stops, pulls back on, restarts again. And her guardians have done an absolutely stunning job on training that. And we've even got to the point now where, because the guardians, they, they live about 40, 50 minutes away from me. So obviously they don't want to be coming every week to do this work. So we've been doing this work long distance as well. So in between the sessions that come to my salon, I've been sending them, they've been sending me videos and I've been sending them feedback. Um, what's your opinion of a chin rest room and stuff? It's exactly the same as your hand. You can use a, um, you could use a stool or a chair or a table, just as the, as long as the protocol is chin on whatever you want them to put it on, means grooming happens, chin off means the grooming stops. I've got no problems with uh, the grooming stand, uh, chin rest stand for that. Um, I'm going to raise my hand for a minute. Um, I, the breeder for my poodle is actually working on coming out with one and uh, because she's found it very helpful for her show poodles to use it as a chin rest. And she told me initially it starts with the Velcro strap. And I'm not a real fan of that, but um, the idea- Oh, she put, you mean to put the, the strap around the dog? Yeah, around the head, like with the puppy yeah. when you're first no. starting. And I don't want to do that, but no. the idea of it, of it, because we used to use something similar with our sheep and it holds the, if they put their chin there, then they stay on the table much better. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've never used one of the chin rest stands, so I didn't realize the thing went over, the strap went over. So anything to do with the restraint is a big no-no. Yeah, it's, it's a new thing that's coming out. It's, she's still in development, she's still in development with it, but she said that the, the Velcro piece is optional, that you oh, don't right, okay. have to use it, which with my dogs, they all, both have a really good chin rest, so I wouldn't use yeah. it, but it's something that I was interested in looking at because it seemed like a better way to rest the dog so they're not whole, if, when you're doing stuff with them so they just go back. <laughs> yeah it, yeah and and because I'm not sure you know some of you might have disabilities where you can't use both hands at the same time so having something for the dog to put the chin on so you've just got to use the one hand would be a better option for those people um just to make it easier and I must admit um I've got a, one dog that he actually rests his chin on my my arm rather than my hand but as long as he's given me some sort of indicator that yes grooming can start I'm not bothered whether he's got his hand in my his chin in my hand or it's on my arm they, they all seem to find their own way to to give you permission or to stop the grooming if you give them that choice um i've had a lot of groomers saying oh how can you keep a dog on the table if it's not got restraints on well i just do <laughs> i don't i've not got a magic wand i just build up the trust if the dog wants to be on the table they will choose to stay there if they exactly. don't want to be on the table that's where you struggle and need something I don't use a table strictly because my dogs are super big, 
but same kind of thing. They have the mat on the floor. I've actually got to the point where I phased out the mat and I can point to any place on the floor, but they know like instead of doing the chin rest, they will lay their head completely down. So they're completely on their side flat. And the second they pick their head up, then I stop whatever I'm doing. And as soon yeah. as they lay their head back down, I start. So you can shape that kind of start button behavior to anything you want. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's just that exactly. it's an indicator to you. As long as you and the dog can communicate. In fact, my little party poodle that says she's not a big fan of being groomed. And um, I've been working on being able to dry her because that's been one of her major problems. And I've worked out now that if I groom her, if I dry her at the same time as my other poodle, she will actually, she claws at my arm for me to brush her and have the dryer on her whilst I'm drying my other poodle. So if I'm drying my other poodle and brushing her, she pulls my arm across. So I do a couple of brushes, just watch her body language and then go back onto my other poodle and she'll pull my arm back to her. So that's a, another way that she communicates that come on it's my turn to be groomed so dogs will work with, you know if, if you watch your dogs it's, it all goes back to these observations if you watch your dog find out what they like to do because obviously if it's something they like to do uh, they'll do it much more easily for you they'll do it much quicker for you so if they like to have their head resting on you then perhaps a chin rest is good for that or um, chin rest onto a cushion um, if they like to lie down next to you, then mat protocol, you know, a mat next to you and they can teach them to use the mat protocol instead. Most dogs, there's a way to be able to groom them using a consent based method. Um, some it takes a little bit longer, but if they all get there in the end, one way or another. So it's just finding what suits individual dog. I also use the bucket game, Shrag Patel's, Shrag Patel's bucket game on one dog. Um, I don't use that generally because it takes, it's more difficult to teach the owners to do that, the guardians to do that. So I tend to um, teach them one of the other protocols that are much easier for them to get the timing right. I find with the bucket game, they finish up distracting the dog with the bucket rather than getting the dog to look at the bucket for grooming to happen and then when they look away from the bucket grooming stops but I've got one dog in particular that we have used it for and if I switch the clippers on anywhere near her when I've not got a bucket there she totally freaks out if I've got the bucket there switch the clippers on and I can clip her off just while we use the bucket game um what the difference is between look at having the well, I know what the difference is, it's that con con uh, consent, but I would have never believed that just a bucket can make so, so much difference to, to a dog. It does. So I'm going to use it. Um, I'm a big believer in doing what works uh, rather than trying to find lots of different ways to get something to work. And that's why I like to have lots of different tools in my toolbox, because every dog I groom is completely different. I don't groom any two dogs the same even two dogs from the same breed from the same family they get different you know they probably get a different protocol or they get groomed in a different order uh, it's just working with that dog to find out what makes it tick and what makes the grooming easier for them does that all make sense is <laughs> no that's like perfectly aligned with my philosophy in that each dog might be a little bit different. And I've kind of like, anytime I get a new puppy, I will let them kind of lead by example, by grooming the other dogs first, the ones that are used yes. to it so that they can see, oh, this is a calming thing. And, you know, then they can approach and get their treats for approaching and slowly work into where I can groom the puppy. And that's just kind of my habit of, you know, my puppies learn so much from my older dogs. Oh God, the yeah. older dogs are such brilliant trainers, yeah. sort of brilliant teachers. Um, Cause I've always had uh, multi-dog households and you always find the older dog teaches the young dogs. So right. I've got, let's say I've got working cocker uh, now, which can, working cockers we know can be very busy dogs, very lively dogs. He's a complete dream in the house. Take him, out, take him for a walk in the morning, 
our Ravi belt round comes back and he just snoozes and relaxes all day. And it's just because he's lived with an older dog that goes for a walk in the morning, comes back and snoozes all day. So he's just picked it up from the other dogs, which is brilliant. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't be doing with a dog that's on the go 24 seven. I noticed how much my, well, he's now two and a half, but Azul, my service dog, when he was a puppy, was learning so much more from the older dogs. Like I had taught him a paw target and a nose to hand target, but I hadn't taught him the chin rest yet. And one day I was doing a joint training session where I had all three dogs, my puppy and the two others. It was basically a session in taking turns, but because <laughs> I was going from nose, nose, nose to all three and paw, paw, paw and chin, chin on the older ones and back to nose for the puppy, he started offering his chin. Like, oh. uh, come on, I know what you want here. So I put my hand up to match his chin and he threw it right back in. And I, like, I didn't ever train it he simply learned it from watching the other dogs repeat it over and over again and so i started yeah, it really it applying how it they learn other than other dogs <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter how they learn it as long as they yeah. they learn it and they learn the rules around it as well and i've continued that since he i learned that i observed that so early that he was picking up on that that i've used that in anything challenging and especially grooming um, I got a new blower this year, never had a blower before, but I knew I had used a reverse vacuum on cam years ago and he loved it. So I knew he would accept it well. So when I got it, I started with cam, my older dog, you know, and let him see and let the puppy kind of just explore and come in and maybe one quick blow on him and back to cam. And of course, Cam's standing there <laughs> strutting his stuff like he is gold because <laughs> he's getting the attention. So Azul took to it and now he pretty much lays down and falls asleep when I'm blowing him oh. because that's his comfort. He just lays down and stretches out. And then when I need him to flip over to get the other side, he'll stand <laughs> up, stretch, lay down. And within a few seconds, oh, he's sound bless. asleep again. <laughs> so what easier way to groom the dog when, than when they're sleeping? <laughs> uh, funny you should say that. I've had a, a new dog in today. Um, I, I don't usually take new dogs on until I've done a free work session with them, but I've got an old, um, an old neighbor that came round. She's got a lurcher and she says, oh, can you please clip her? She's really struggling in the heat. She's 14 years old. So, I've, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like I could say no because the dog was obviously struggling. So I says, well, bring her around. I will do what I can, but if she struggles, it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, as it turned out, she we, she got in the bath. You could tell she wasn't over keen about the bath, but she didn't splash around. She wasn't giving too many calming signals. You could just tell she wasn't particularly keen to be in the bath. But when I got her out of the bath, um, I thought there's no way I'm putting her on the table. So I got my grooving mat out and I sat on that and she actually came and laid across my legs while I clipped her off. And she actually fell asleep. <laughs> and it's the first time I groomed her. I, a, a guardian was absolutely stunned that she'd actually fell asleep across my legs. Uh, and yes, we had to wake her up halfway through so that she could do her other side as well. Probably one of the easiest grooms I've ever done. She was very comfortable with you. She felt oh, relaxed. Oh, she certainly <laughs> was. <laughs> you know, and that, that's the key to grooming. It really is to me is that if the dog is comfortable and relaxed, they'll let you do pretty much anything you need to do. Yeah. And yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about, I know you had this on your Facebook not too long ago, so I'm sure you don't mind. But oh. so occasionally there's that incident, whatever it may be, that requires something that we know the dog is not going to like, but it's for their own safety or own health. So um, for example, Cam will every now and then and he hasn't done it in years but we'll rip a paw pad and need to have it bandaged and as much as he doesn't mind me touching his paws any given day he it's sore so he doesn't want to and in that case I have to not really hold him down because all it takes to hold him down is a gentle hand laying on top of him yeah. so no pressure no restraint but it's there. So I will have to have a family member just kind of put a hand there so that I can then hold his paw. And I have to hold his paw a little bit tighter than I 
would like to, yeah. but I just have to power through it because he needs it. You know, yes. that has to be taken care of. And I know you had kind of a similar experience. You want to talk a little bit about that? I can't remember what it was now. Honestly, it was if a I bird. Go to sleep. You had gone for oh, a while. Oh, yes, last yep. weekend. Yes, my, so last weekend I, I do hoopers and I took my dogs to a hooper show and I thought, in my infinite wisdom, I thought, let's go on a different walk today. Because uh, obviously I, st I still have to walk them when, when I'm on a holiday. And uh, my working cocker found uh, lots of bushes with burrs all over them. And he ran into them and he was on a long line because there's lots of pheasants about. So I have to have him on a long line. It is on a harness. It's not, it's not on his collar. So he has a long line on his uh, harness. And as he went, he pulled all the burrs out of the bush and they were all stuck all along the, because it was a fabric long line. And unfortunately, it went under my party poodle's legs and she got them stuck on her, she's got little pom-poms on her, on her ankles and one went in on her back leg and stuck in there. Now, I hadn't noticed, unfortunately, I didn't notice at that point, it wasn't until I got back to the caravan that I noticed that she got this burr so um, I waited until she got on the bed and I started to tease it out a little bit. Now this is the one that's really averse to a lot of pulling about for grooming, she likes it nice and simple, keep it nice and easy so I keep her in a nice easy style for her um, and she let me get about halfway through and then obviously it was tighter the more I got to the, close to the skin the tighter it was and it was obviously uncomfortable for her so she started growling at me so I thought I'm going to leave it for a minute and then I thought no it's got to come out and I tried again and as I tried again she pulled away from me and went and over to the other side of the bed because I'm in my caravan so my, my bed's set up all the time that's if I don't have a, a set here I sit on my bed so she went over to the side and unfortunately she went over to the other side it got even more tangled and tangled in with her other back leg as well so I thought this has got to come out um, so I went over and I actually did risk a bite because I just got a pair of scissors and went for it um, it was the only way to get it out I didn't pin her down but I just hung on to that leg while I could cut this burr out um, it took me about 30 seconds it didn't take me particularly long to get it out but she was obviously extremely distressed um, and I think had, had it been anybody but me I she would have bitten them um, but she just about she did snap a couple of times she did air snaps a couple of times but she never actually touched my skin but that burr had to come out else otherwise she'd have had a back leg stuck together and then I'd got two legs to undo so yeah and then what I did then because I knew I would have raised her arousal levels and she should have been trigger stacked so I just left her in the corner on the bed where she was kept the other dogs away from her as well so that she wasn't bothered by them um and then probably about half hour later she actually just come and sat next to me and I think she'd just come over to say I forgive you she's not a dog that sits on my knee sitting next to me is is enough for her she's not a my other poodle loves to sit on my knee, but Ritzy, she likes to sit at the side of me. She doesn't like to sit on my knee. And I think that's because I'm very touchy-feely. So if she, she knows if she's on my knee, I'm going to stroke her. Whereas sometimes she doesn't want stroking. She just wants to be next to me. So um, as I say, but it took her about half an hour to come around and come and sit next to me and forgive me. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about earlier. If we can do the majority of the stuff using consent, following the dog's lead when we do need to do those difficult things that probably we don't enjoy doing a little bit more pressure they definitely don't like doing they recover much more quickly so that we can they, they, the arousal levels come down a lot more quickly whereas if I had a, um, forced a right from the beginning her arousal levels would have gone straight up and that would have been it. I wouldn't have got back, back down again. So she knew that, um, well, I hope she knew that I was doing it to help her, not to frighten her. So it just made it easier for her in the end. So, yeah, 
and I do this use the same principles for dogs in the salon like I was talking about the dog yesterday that came in with the claw curled round into a, a, a dual claw curled round into a, a pad 99% of the groom was done with consent and it was just that one bit where I had to hold a paw not forcefully but say so usually just support the paw in my hand but I just close my thumb over it just to hold it still just to get that so if I can do the majority of the groom without force it means I can have a little bit I've got a little bit more leeway to do those more difficult bits that I know the dogs don't like and they can come down much quicker from that arousal whereas if I was forcing them through the whole groom those extra bits would require a muzzle perhaps somebody holding them more restraints so it just makes sense to me to give them as much freedom as they they want for as long as they want so that I can do these little more difficult bits it all comes to. down to relationship it does you know, yeah if they trust you to follow their cues and listen to what they do they're more likely to let you do what you need to do and in that rare instance where you really have to do something you know they don't like they will forgive you quickly because they know that was the only option at the time yeah. you know that they, they can understand we don't mean to hurt them and if we have to do something that's mildly painful for some reason you know a medical reason or something they can be very forgiving of that they don't hold a grudge for long <laughs> no <laughs> so if I, um I if, I'd a, a, if I'd have done that when I first had her she would definitely have bit me she wasn't she didn't trust anybody when I first had her because she came to me at a year old so uh, she didn't right. trust anybody. <laughs> and we have been have talking a... for about 45 minutes. So I just want to see if anybody has any questions. And I know Cindy does. She, <laughs> so she can go first. Okay. And then anyone else, if you want to type it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, there's not that many people here. So just raise your hand. Go ahead, Cindy. So I, ha I have a standard poodle and a great Pyrenees. And both of them will let me handle their feet. And the poodle will let me clip his feet, but neither one of them like the vibration of the Dremel and they don't like the clippers with, for the nail clippers. Do you have any suggestions on how to get them so that they won't mind so much, you know, so that they'll tolerate getting their, their nails done? Again, it, a lot comes down to trust. Um, when you do the nails, when you do the claws, do you get the dogs to stand or to sit or to lay down? I have tried it always. Because oh, um, that sometimes, because if you've got the dog standing as you lift one paw, it it sends the rest of the body all out of yeah. position. And then if they've got pain, that can make things worse as well. So um, one of the techniques I use a lot with dogs that don't like and, and this is taking it back even further, a, a lot of the dogs I groom don't like or didn't like having their legs groomed. Mm -hmm. So I use a technique called feathering. I'm going to bring my little dog in now. <laughs> I knew he'd come in handy for something. So uh, it's a technique called feathering that comes from T-touch. So if they don't like the legs being touched, I start first with the side of my finger and I just flick the very end of the fur. If they, they move or give me a calming signal, I start to start back at the top. Just gently keep going down. It, again, if they move again, back to the top. So it's building that trust that you're not going to go any further than they can cope with. Once you can okay. do it lightly all the way down, you do a little bit more pressure. And it's always best to start with your hand or something like a sponge or a paintbrush or a makeup brush, something really light. And then once you can do it with a bit more pressure, then you can swap it to a brush or the nail clippers and again start off lightly and then had a bit more pressure as they get used to having it done lightly so that's to get to the feet with some dogs it depends exactly what we're worried about with the clippers some dogs don't like the sound of the clippers mm -hmm. so you can counter condition that by using some pasta so if you've got a pit piece of pasta and you just keep click it, uh, cutting it but giving mm -hmm. them a treat and counter right. conditioning the noise. Um, if it's the sensation unfortunately it's just counter conditioning that 
emotional response around that. So okay. it, you do really need to go backwards to come forwards again. Because uh, I, I know a lot of people really struggle with claws and they'll say, well, I've tried everything, but what they've not done when they've tried a new technique, they've not gone right back to the beginning. So at the top of the shoulder, for example, they've just took the paw and tried a different technique on the paw rather than building uh -huh. it up and um, getting the dog's confidence of counter conditioning or desensitization around those as well. Uh, you could use um, a, a protocol type approach. So if you've got the, the stand, put the chin, they could put the chin on the stand while you do it. And again, it's not going to happen overnight. Right. But if you do a little bit each day, you know, so one day you, you get them to put the chin on, you pick the paw up, put it straight back down, pick the paw up straight back down. The next day you might touch the claw with the clippers straight back down and just build it up into tiny little steps so that you don't overwhelm them all at once. The other option is to teach them how to use a scratch board. There's lots of videos on YouTube on how to use a scratch board. We've been um, doing the scratch board. It, it just, it doesn't seem like my poodle especially seems like he just grows nails like crazy. I, yeah, mine does as well. <laughs> well, one does, one, one doesn't grow quite as quickly, but my, my brown poodle, her, <laughs> he's I have fine to do it as about once a week. He's fine with the clippers on his feet with the, you know, when I'm clipping his, giving him poodle feet, but he does not like anything touching his nails it's specifically the nail but you know i don't know if it's the vibration or the sensation and i probably just need to spend the time doing the counter conditioning more of it unfortunately there's not a magic magic no. response for that one you know it, it's putting the work in to get that better emotional response with the clippers unfortunately but if it's, it makes you feel better, I hate doing nails. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got the, the scratch pad. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling we're going to get lots of questions on nails because that's a really common one. Um, let's go ahead and turn it over to Jen. Jen, what is your question or comment? Hey, guys. Okay, um, so so what you ended up saying with the pasta, like I think that's a really, really good idea. Um, that's something that I haven't heard before, and I've checked out a lot of different information. My dog also does the scratch board. We had a very traumatic incident happen when she was a puppy. The first time I took her to a groomer, they put her on a table. The table was metal and unstable and wobbly and they put the thing around her neck to hold her in place and then they ended up cutting the quick on two of her nails and we have tried doing so much counter conditioning in so many different ways we've actually worked with penny in her living room also penny's tried stuff with her and she'll get close to allowing it she will allow me to actually like tap the clippers on her nail um but I can't use the clippers we have taught the scratch board I've taught her also to you know when we're on our walks we almost do it as a parkour thing for her to scratch cement oh, walls yeah. and brick walls and things like that because like Cindy <laughs> Betsy has very strong nails and um they just, they're very hard to penetrate. So I, I try to keep them responsibly as short as possible. And she does walk on a lot of pavement, but because they're thick and they're black, she really is at the point that she needs to have them clipped. I'm like this close to talking to the vet about having her put under for a short period of time, just so that we can get them back to, I mean, they're not, they're not as long as some dog's nails are where, you know, their owners just don't care and let them go and let them go, but they're definitely longer than what they should be. And she's a big dog. So I worry about, you know, hip dysplasia in the future or something like that. If her, if her pads are not properly sitting on the ground, she's very active too. Yeah. Um, so if it is the actual, so the sound is definitely something. So I want to try that pasta trick. I think that yeah. sounds, that sounds really, really helpful. Um, but if it's the actual, the feel of the clipping, is there something that you can recommend that would not be clipper related that I could try to mimic 
that feeling of the clipper on her nail and that initial tug. Um, I mean, you could to, use you could use a little pair of baby scissors. Anything that looks like a scissors, she she's not going to have instantly. Okay. Yeah. Have you tried? Have you tried using a just a, a lady's nail file, an acrylic nail file? Yep. Yep. And she won't We've tolerate done that the file. Thing. And she will allow it for a couple seconds on each nail, but she won't let me, you know, keep going. But it doesn't have the same sensation no. as the actual, like the, you know. No, I was, I was thinking I just more made of, that sound and she just yeah. jumped. <laughs> oh, bless her. I was thinking more from a point of filing the nails on a daily basis rather than trying to clip them. But if she's got thick black nails, it might not be strong enough to get in this yeah. stuff. Um, you, you're a bit, we're, we're a bit restricted on claws because there are, you know, there's only three basic, well, four options, which is the normal clippers, a Dremel, scratch board, um, a nail file, or actually this five, um, not bother doing them at all, <laughs> which some people seem to prefer. Um, no. So I think it's it's going to just need a combination of them, perhaps to discuss with you, Bet, about um, a short-term sedation. Try not to have a sedative that just makes them a bit drowsy, because that's, I always think a date rape, that date rape drug when, when people talk about that, because... We be actually tried that what, once, and it, it just made her more uncomfortable, yeah. and... I, I wasn't happy with that at all. If we're going to do something like that, I just want her knocked out as though she's getting twilighted for yeah. a little surgery, do it and then have it be done. And then start from there where, it, where they're at a more manageable length that we yeah. don't have to work through as much nail in order to keep them maintained. I mean, she's four and we've managed to do this for three and a half years and they're not looking like some people's atrocious so dogs. Yes. Edward scissor hands. <laughs> exactly. But they're definitely, I can hear them on the ground. Yeah. They're, you know, I know that they're longer than what they should be. We're just, we're getting closer, but, but I feel like if we, if we got that one extra length off, that would, that would help in the long run with keeping them maintained. It, it is a, I always feel that claws are, for some dogs are always going to be a work in progress. My working cocker had him from a puppy I did all the pre-work with him and I was able to cut his nails and then he ripped his dew claw all that went out the window um, and we've got to the stage now where he will get on the table he'll get on my grooming table and ask well I'll ask him I'll say come on let's do a claw he'll get on the grooming table let me do one claw and then he has a massive fool around and has to get off the table. So I do one, one nail a day or one day a nail every other day. Fortunately, his nails don't grow particularly quickly. Um, but it has taken me a while to get into that stage. Um, and it was, again, it was because whenever I go in the salon, if I've not got a dog in, if Talis comes with me, he's always straight on the table. So I thought, actually, I'm going to use that. And that's going to be his where he gets his nails clipped. So if he decides to get on the table and I ask him if he's okay having his nails clipped, that's when I'm gonna do it. So I could have done it on the bed upstairs or on the floor, but he was telling me that the table was meaningful for him. So that's where I do his, but as I say, it is one a day, one at a time. And he does have a bit of a, a fall around meltdown afterwards. So uh, yeah, she was yeah. properly conditioned as a puppy and everything, yeah. but it was, it was, specifically the stand and then the way that this groomer handled her and I, I told the groomer look I'm she's training to be a service dog I'm trying to do everything with positive reinforcement mm -hmm. and I think the groomer was put off by that because I was standing right there and I was giving uh -huh. her treats to try to make her more comfortable and then it was just it was it was such a bad experience mm -hmm. and we <laughs> I, I was trying to do where, because she wouldn't let me know, go near her with the clippers, I was trying to do like one at night while she was sleeping. And then <laughs> she just stopped trusting me. And yeah. so I, I didn't want to 
keep pushing it and break that um, further. So, I mean, even, even now, like she, when, when I made that noise and she was on the couch next to me, she jumped off of the couch. She's no longer laying on the couch. She's like, you have that noise thing out. I'm, I'm not laying over here by you anymore, lady. And yeah, this so is, obviously she needs, she needs that noise. Um, needs some that noise to de a desensitize it. Yeah, so do desensitize and counter conditioning together. Uh, mm -hmm. you, and you don't, you can use the thicker, you know, the pasta twirls. Because mm -hmm. that's got more. Another good thing to have is make sure you've got the, a good pair of clippers. So I use the Miller Forge clippers with a red handle and they go through claws just like butter. So if you've got a, an old pair of clippers or even a brand new pair of clippers, if they're not cutting particularly efficiently, then that um, can make it even more uncomfortable for them. And I find the Miller Forge as well, they, there's not such a, when you do it, it's, it's more of a soft. Um, again, if, you, if you're able to bath up, if you can do a claws, do some claws straight after the bath, because the claws are softer then, um, and probably won't make such a loud click noise. But yeah. The bath is another... <laughs> We, my my dog, she doesn't get stinky, and you know, she, we uh, the way that her coat is, we basically do a bath like every six months, and right. we don't really have a need to do it more than that unless she really rolls in something. So I just keep it at like what she needs, and then we just deal with it every six months. And then, yeah. <laughs> but there's no way that I can wait six months to do something to her nails. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I also I saw Susan. So I joined Susan Garrett's uh, nail group on Facebook a long time ago, and I loved her instruction for how to just like gradually cut little sections of the nail mm -hmm. instead of doing like one hard clip. I never had known before her group that that was a way to do it. And that actually seems like it avoids the clicking noise, but it's just the stinking it, she sees the clipper she knows what it is if I grab my nail clippers to clip my nails she runs because Aww. it's she it, it it gave her such a bad association she tried working with several groomers to try to counter condition we did a half an hour a week for six weeks at one groomer just to try to get her comfortable on the table in that six weeks that groomer was able to cut two nails and ended up getting the quick on both of them because she mm. so she said there's only one other dog that she hasn't been able to clip as long as she has been a groomer and Betsy's just so extreme that she was just like yeah I think we need to go back to the drawing board on this one so, so um, maybe the best may be an option <laughs> yeah yeah but I really do love that pasta idea that is something I have not I've, I've looked at a lot of different groups and that's the first time I've heard that one that's a really that made a lot of sense as soon as you said it you know what I can't remember whether I came up with that idea or somebody else suggested it but it's something that's really stuck with me because it makes sense you know it's the yeah. noise that bothered about well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I hope it's helped. Yeah. I, I hope you can get your dog sorted out on his on the claws. It's claws do seem to be the biggest um, obstacle for most 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 dogs. I know. Um, um, sorry, I didn't see another hand, so I'm just going to ask my question. <laughs> okay. So I know a lot of times, like. Most of us here know desensitization and encounter conditioning well, and we know how to apply it pretty good. But typically, the easiest way to do that and the way you learn to do that is with treats or, you know, food the dog loves. But what mm -hmm. if there isn't a food the dog loves? You know, Azul being a husky and having a little bit of a stomach issue is very, very picky. And while he might love sardines, he doesn't love them enough to make it worth getting in the bathtub so do you have any tricks or advice for other things like i mean he is very toy motivated and loves toys but even his yeah, toy is not toy, enough to get um, in there. <laughs> I, I groom a, a labrador and um 
she's a Labrador, so she's very food motivated, but food over excites her. So I don't want to be using food in the salon and over excited too much because then I still can't do anything because she's a big girl. Um, so I started taking a tuggy time with her. So she'll get in the bath, no problem. She'll have a bath, no problem, but she's terrified of the dryer. Now, being a Labrador, it's not, you know, the end of the world if I can't dry her fully. But I've found now that what I can, what I do with her is I play tuggy while the dryers aren't over her. So we play around the dryer and she's getting more, well, she's getting less sensitive to the dryer now because whilst we're playing, the noise is going in there. Um, Obviously, I started it off with the noise just in the background, but now I've got the nozzle, because I've got a rigid nozzle, so I've got the nozzle now, so it's actually blowing on her. And as long as we're playing with the toy, she doesn't seem to notice the drying's going on. Uh, and she's one of the dogs that, when, when a guardian pulls up, because I groom from home, I've got a shed in my, in my backyard, in my garden, and... I've got gates down the side of my house, so the dogs come up there. But what I have to do when she arrives, the guardian gives me a call and I have to open all the gates because the dog jumps out the boot and is straight in my... And if the, the owner was attached, if she got the lead, she would be in the salon as well. Yet yeah, she detests, you know, at one point she detested the dryer. So, yeah, for some dogs, uh, it is... Um, toys for work um, for azul his big hang-up is our actual like we don't have a bathtub we have a handicapped accessible stand-in kind of shower so it's got a sprayer that comes right down to his level and it's getting in that bathtub that is his problem because he has a pool outside he loves the sprinkler <laughs> and attacks the sprinkler if we're out on a walk and there's an automatic sprinkler somewhere he's got to play in it yeah. Okay, so why not why not use what you you know he likes? So you bath him in the paddling pool and you use the sprinkler to rinse him. Well, and I've tried that. <laughs> actually, oh, right. that, okay. that's what we do all summer long. <laughs> so, and he's actually a pretty clean dog too. So just the act of getting wet and blows him, I don't usually have to shampoo him down. You know, if he's played in a lake, our lakes and waters are really clean around here. So usually that's good enough and I can just blow them down, but there's one or two that might make them a little itchy so that I'll spray them off with the hose. And in the <laughs> summer that works great. And he typically only gets maybe one bath in the winter because he doesn't <laughs> like the shower. And I do have him to the point to where he'll tolerate it, but even water off totally, like I have to be playing the funnest game in the world to get him to stand in the shower with no water out in the shower. <laughs> Because it's just okay. the act of getting in that area. So when you, how do you get him in that area? Does he choose to go in that or do you lift him into that? He can get in himself. Um, when we're not focused on bath time, it's usually playing a game of chase me through the house. <laughs> and then I go in and he follows me. And then I'll just kind of stop there and he'll hang out for a minute, but he won't hang out for more than a minute and he's gone. When it comes to actual bath time, then it's, uh, I have to have him heel to the bathroom because it's like he knows, he sees me getting they ready. Know. They know. <laughs> and yeah, so I mean, he will heel to the bathroom and he'll walk in the tub and the whole time, unless I remind him he has to stay. Now he'll stay on his own. Once in a while, I'll put my arm up just as a reminder, but not touching him, touching the wall. So if he really wanted to, he could go over or under my arm. <laughs> but other than that, like if I don't remind him to stay, he'll be jumping out every second, which I mean, I closed the bathroom door so he can't go far because I always assume he's going to jump out at least once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, so we'll stop and wait and I'll get him back in because, of course, he's got shampoo on. <laughs> he's got to come out. <laughs> You know, so shampoo, but, sh rinseless shampoo. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, I've tried that, but my husband is very sensitive to smells as well. Yeah. And that shampoo, we can't find one of those that doesn't have a smell that triggers him. Have you tried the pet remedy one? I have not. I've seen it, but I haven't bought it. I know which yeah, one you mean, though. <laughs> yeah, pet, pet remedy do one. I've, I've tried it and I was impressed with the results. 
Good. Uh, wouldn't be one I could use every day on my dogs, but just to get that, you know, right. bit of bit of gunge off them, it, you know, to do on a little a little area. Um, right. And he yeah, tolerates so stuff like that. I mean, I do have some of that, but because of my husband, I just can't use it. Everything yeah. here has perfume in it. It's like I don't want perfume. I just no. wanted to clean my dog. Yeah. But, and that's that's one of the reasons I um I don't use dog colognes at all. A lot of groomers give them a spray of cologne after the groom. No. No. Nope. <laughs> I, I I can't help thinking that if certain perfumes and aromas give me a migraine there's no reason to think that they don't affect the dog in a similar way right um, and how would we so, know if a dog had a migraine <laughs> i would imagine you'd be very grumpy right <laughs> but well, I, I, you know we don't know whether they have headaches or not we can't you know right so i i'm i'm just assuming worst case scenario that you know because we know they've got such a their power, their power of scent is just so much more powerful than ours. So, if we can smell something, they can smell it a right. thousand million times better than we can. So, I just think that some of these perfumes that the groomers are using, it just must be so overwhelming for the dogs, mm -hmm. and it's on their body, so they can't get away from it. So, I try and keep all my shampoos, uh, any products they use, I just try and keep them as neutral as possible. I have found that using the blower, because I have one that I can like start out really slow and build intensity in. I actually bought a pretty expensive blower, which is not me because I'm a cheapskate when it comes to most stuff. <laughs> but I've found that using that blower really cuts down on my need to shampoo. Like I don't need to shampoo yeah. them as much because even just the plain water and blower gets all the dander off and therefore eliminates any odor he might have. Yeah. And it helps him to not be itchy and he needs a good spray in now because his chin's all itchy, he's scratching now. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll get that this afternoon. We'll go play in the sprinkler. <laughs> Your blower can also be used to blow out the undercoat before you brush. Yeah. Yes. That's really helpful. I do that with Poe sometimes. That was my original reason for purchasing it because this year has been a really rough year for both dogs. And actually dogs all around have shed more this year than they typically do. So yeah, that was other, my main reason for looking for the blower. <laughs> the other thing you could do is set up an outdoor wash rack like we did with Nick today when we put him in the um, horse yeah. wash rack. <laughs> I was at my sister's house and she's got this uh, amazing horse facility that she set up over the last 30 years and she's got hot water out to her horse grooming area and or and cross ties and we had my dog and the stall mats you know which are like three quarters of an inch rubber and so we had my dog in the um in the horse wash rack and washed him this morning because he got dirty playing in the arena and stuff so did he um, roll in horse poo <laughs> yeah basically oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's nice because you know in january when it's 30 degrees we can take him out and wash him and over there if i had to but in reality i'd wash i'd just wash him in the house if that was the case yeah but he was much calmer in the wash rack i mean he's very cooperative in the bathtub but i can tell he doesn't like it he tolerates it yeah but he was much calmer in the wash rack because there's not all that echoing that you generally get with an in-home bathtub yeah you know, and i've noticed the difference between my dogs between a regular bathtub like we would use versus if you go to a pet grooming store where they have the bathtub and it's not surrounded by the same surrounds it doesn't echo as much and they seem to be calmer yeah i i i, I find there's a pro not a problem with baths but a lot of groomers will say this dog doesn't like the bath and I'll say what what is it about the bath they don't like and they can't seem to get the idea that it might not actually be the, the bath it might be the texture of the bath it might be the echo of the bath it might be how the bath looks it might be the vibration the water makes when it hits the bottom of the bath so I always try to tell them to break it down so don't just switch the shower on straight on the dog because then you can't tell whether it's the water that's bothering the dog, whether it's 
the shampoo that's bothering the dog. And it's, you know, if we break it down, introduce each little bit separately, we can identify exactly which part of the groom they don't like or which part of the bath they don't like. Um, I had a puppy come start with me a few weeks, well, probably about six months ago now. Uh, and he'd been brilliant up until the time I put him in the bath and he was fine in the bath until I switched the shower on and the water hit the bottom of the bath. Now, if I'd have just gone straight in and bathed him, I would have never picked that up. So all I did the next, the next time, because if I, if, when I've got a puppy, if they've had a negative experience, I stop the groom straight away because I don't want to, to keep reinforcing any negative associations. So I took him out of the bath. The next time he came for a groom, for, for a bath, I put some vet bed in the bottom of the bath so it didn't make that vibration absolutely fine so by breaking it down and introducing things slowly for me I could identify exactly which part of the bath he didn't like do something about it job done I hadn't thought about it might be the water hitting the bathtub so that's a good point let's take the yeah. one last question from Ashlyn which she put in the chat and then we'll wrap up so she actually has two there um, the what about looking the you the look at that game with nail clippers? Are you familiar with that game? That's a real popular one here. I don't know if yeah. it is in the UK. Okay. And then the second one is about the blow dryer. So we can talk about the look at get that game first. Uh, yeah. So um, I, I don't know how you use it in um, in the US, but in the, we use it as the cans conditioning. So the look at the the clippers reward, clippers reward, um, or the brush, whatever it is. So it's just it's just a method of counts conditioning how we use well how I use it, um, and you can obviously can combine that with desensitisation. So you start at a distance with the look at it reward, and then get nearer and nearer and nearer as the dog is able to cope. So uh, I think some of the difficulties with Things like look at look at it and um, cans condition is people tend to rush and get cl too close too quickly mm -hmm. because they think it's fine because I'm treating all the time. But you need to make sure to, if you're using desensitization with cans condition, you need to make sure at every point they're relaxed so you don't move to the next step a little bit closer until they're absolutely relaxed at the point you were at else otherwise you just finish up with a dog that thinks oh god another treat's coming I'm going to have to put up with this rather than oh god there's a treat coming I like this so it's that's how I use the, the look at that anyway uh, to to use as a, a cans conditioning method and desens combining it with desensitization we actually talked about that a little bit when we were discussing ACE as well, because that's something I had just never thought of with ACE is that you could use that free work area as a place to desensitize, you know, yes. by just placing your clippers somewhere in the area and, you know, maybe associating it with one of your highest value treats you're using in that area and you're not going anywhere near them. And so the dog is then choosing to go near those clippers because you are not anywhere near them because you're yeah. back further observing. So you can watch how comfortable they are and watch how they're slowly getting more comfortable before you move into the next step of working with those clippers or brush yeah. or whatever it is that that's, they're bothered by. And I know that's a little bit about um, Ashlyn's next question. So Daisy is her young puppy. I don't think she's quite even five months old yet. So very young. Oh. And she has a reaction to the blow dryer. So right now they're towel drying. I guess, what would you suggest like her first step to try to get her used to the blower? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm sitting quite hard chair, so I'm gonna have to stand. So <laughs> You're fine, and we can be done really soon. It's a bit so. uncomfortable on it. Um, I actually put a cushion on it this time, but it's, it's still uncomfortable. So. Uh, with the dryer, I often find that desensitization is best for the dryer. Start So it might be that um, when you're drying your own hair, um, your dog's in the next room, you can have, uh, if there's somebody there with you, they can be doing rewarding and 
uh, treating as the dog's getting more comfortable with the dry run in a different room and then just gradually either move the dryer close to the dog or wait for the dog to come closer to you. Um, so it's it's just a, a, a natural desensitization, usual desensitization as they're relaxed at the position you are, then move a bit closer. Um, I do use quite a lot in the salon. I just have, while I'm bathing the dogs, I'll have the dryer on in the background on the lowest setting facing the wall. So it just becomes background noise. So that's another technique you can use. But obviously, if, if you're using that technique and the dog's obviously still distressed, that's not going to work. So it is all about watching the dog's body language. Are they, um, are they coping with it or are they tolerating? Because obviously, if they're just tolerating that, it's not ideal either, uh, because at some point they may not tolerate it. Uh, you could pair it with counter conditioning or doing things like putting a licky mat down while you're drying your own air. Um, and I know some people, when they're drying their own air, they're then tempted to blow the dryer on the dog, thinking the dog, you know, because the dog's moved closer. Uh, but that, that's not a good idea either, because that breaks any trust that you've already built up with the dog. So having a plan to get from that distance to that distance on the quietest setting and then you move back out and switch it up a little bit and then break it down into getting closer and closer and just keep really keep turning the volume up or if you need to but move back out again so if you increase the volume you increase the space as well and then reduce the space as they get more tolerant with it uh, as i said with the labrador high groom i play with the ball uh, a tuggy toy with her while I'm drying her so she gets more used to the uh, sound of the dry without any um, upset and again you can use the mat protocol so while they're on the mat or on the table or doing a chin rest you can have the dryer switched on once they remove themselves you switch the dryer off um, that's what I used on the dog I, I said I use the bucket game when I first started drying her, I had to use the bucket again to dry her as well. And that's what I did. She looked at the bucket, the dryer was on, stopped looking at the bucket, the dryer goes off. Uh, but now she's she's a lot better with the dryer now. So it's about listening to the dog um, and not overwhelming because a lot of, <laughs> unfortunately, um, with groomers, when we're taught how to groom, dog behaviour is not included. Uh -huh. So a lot of groomers don't know anything about dog body language. They don't know about trigger stacking. So they've got no idea. And a lot of groomers, unfortunately, seem to like more aversive trainers like Caesar Milan. Um, and you hear a lot of it. You've got to show the dog who's boss. Uh -huh. No, you don't. <laughs> well, you do. You, you let the dog know it's boss. Um, so... Um, I've lost my train of thought now so that's okay just, we've actually been chatting quite a while too so we can kind of wrap up I think you answered Ashlyn's question <laughs> so um, yeah we do want to thank you for being here and thanking all the participants I know this replay is going to go out to an awful lot of people please tell me I did hit record <laughs> yes it's, yeah, it's recording, recording. It's recording. Yeah. I'm like recording. oh <laughs> The closed caption thing was covering it. But yeah, so thank you for being here. We really appreciated it. And I think it really helped us. And I do have links in the group for your books and Excellent. your website and your group. So hopefully if they need more help, they will seek you out. Yes. And if you're in the if, if you're in my Facebook group, please do ask questions if you're struggling. There's always even if I'm not in there, there's always people around to, yeah. to help. Uh, I've been in that group for probably about six to nine months, maybe. And yeah, it's an awesome group. I really like it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's one of mine as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I like right. that even though it's grown, I expected, you know, a couple of hundred members and I've got 15,000, we've still mm -hmm. managed to keep it all positive. You know, no. Exactly. If we, if we see any negative, um, you know, like put a muzzle on it or put it in a Carmen cradle, we we don't see much of that anymore. So uh, we're hopefully 
attracting the right sort of groomers and guardians that want to work with the dog, not on the dog. Exactly. I, I just wanted to chime in real quick. I had a, Nick's never been difficult to groom. He's always been pretty easy to groom. But I have a friend, a really good friend of mine who is a groomer and, but she doesn't live in town, so I don't use her. Uh, and I do most of my grooming myself. Well, she came by one time. She came through town one time. And she she um, helped me groom Nick. And because she was working on Nick and I was interacting with Nick while she was grooming him, it went much smoother working with, with her. And since then, when I've groomed him, he's much, much more cooperative with me with grooming because we he had that experience of having his person interacting with him in a non-grooming manner while somebody else was grooming him. And, you know, if, if anybody has a friend that's a groomer that can help them with things like that, that's also <laughs> a really- as long as as long as they use the same ethos of grooming as you do. Uh, exactly. And this friend does. I mean, we've known each Good. other since fifth grade. So, you know, we know what's going on with each other. Yeah. I wouldn't, she's one of the few people that I trust with my dog. But, um, you know, that's just something if you have a groomer that you know and you trust that will work with you that way, it might be something also that could help the dog. I've thought that too, because I've thought taking Azul to one of the, you know, Petco bathtubs or something to that effect would be helpful for him. And if I could find somebody to go with me <laughs> is my goal, because I don't really <laughs> want to do that one alone, knowing that he's already overexcited around other dogs. But having somebody else help, I think, because Azul is like super, super social and absolutely loves other people on him. So if I could interact with him in more of a non-grooming, but more mm. relaxing kind of way while the other person did the hands-on stuff, I think that he would enjoy that more. I just have to make time to be able to do it with one of my kids when I'm in Illinois because it doesn't exist around me. <laughs> or have, or have um, Betsy and Jen help you. Correct. Betsy would not do well, but Jen could help me as well. Mm -hmm. I would I be happy like to help. The idea of the vet mat on the the bottom of the tub. I've thought about that before. 